to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ for we can do nothing against the truth but for it 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 8. We welcome you today to our final lesson in the book of 2 Corinthians. In these last three chapters, chapters 11 through 13, Paul is going to offer some final encouragements to the Christians in Corinth. And friend, as we've noticed throughout this book, Paul is defending his apostleship. He's showing that he's a true apostle of God and is committed for the right reasons but along the way, we have found a lot of encouragement for every Christian to keep living faithfully to the Lord and to never, ever get up, give up. We're so glad that you've joined us today, and we hope that you'll have your Bible ready as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study of 2 Corinthians today. Friend, our lessons today are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area, they'd love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether it be Sunday morning or Sunday night worship or their Wednesday Bible study. You'd be their honored guest. You'll find people there who love the Lord, who are committed to doing what the Bible says, and who are deeply concerned about the salvation of people's souls. If you'd like to study the Word of God further, you've got a Bible question, they'd be more than happy to sit down and discuss the Word of God with you. Friend, we also want you to know that at the Gospel of Christ, we want to help you in any way that we can spiritually. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com? You can access all of our media from there, our videos and audios and written material, transcripts, study questions, just a good variety of quality Bible study material that you can use in your own spiritual growth. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lessons, we encourage you to download it from our website using our uh, media request form, or if you'd like a hard copy on DVD or CD, we'd be happy to make that to you available free of charge as well. Just contact us through our media request form and we'd be glad to do that as well. And friend, in the way the world's moving today with smartphones and everybody on the move, we want to encourage you as well to download our app, both for Apple and Android, iPhone and Android phones from the respective Play Stores, and there you can use that as a good way to study the Word of God in our busy lives as well. Let's think now about 2 Corinthians. And as we begin these last three chapters, Paul is going to go back to the beginning to remind the Corinthians of certain things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul confirms that the Genesis account and the temptation of Adam and Eve, that really did happen. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse number 2. Paul says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betroth to you, you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. For I fear, lest somehow... As the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. As Paul writes to these Christians, you can hear the love he has for them, but you can also hear the concern. These Christians have been tricked or duped before into believing some things that maybe weren't true about Paul or maybe even about a false gospel. And so Paul says, I'm concerned about you. I know you've been betrothed to Christ and that you've given your life to Him, but I know how crafty the devil is also. And he says, let me remind you of that. Just as that sly serpent in his craftiness deceived Eve, don't let your minds be corrupted away from the simplicity of Christ. Friend, what's great about the New Testament, God's plan of salvation, the church that you read about in the Bible, is the simplicity of it. God set a simple plan in motion to save mankind. He gave His Son for us. He's given us the Bible. He's told us what to do. The Bible lays out a clear plan for salvation, for the church, for worship. And when we read and study it, it's very simple by itself. 
But the problem is, Satan has tricked so many people with lies and with error and with false doctrine that he's moved them away from the simplicity of Christ. And so Paul says, I don't want that to happen to you. I know Satan did it to Eve in the garden. The serpent did it to Eve in the garden. I know how crafty he is. You watch out for that. And friend, that's the encouragement we offer today as well. There's a lot of false teachers in our world. There always have been. There's a lot of uh, wolves in sheep clothing, as Jesus put it in Matthew uh, chapter 7 through 11. There's a lot of people who are in it for the wrong motives. They only want what they can get out of it. But friend, be sure, the Bible is our guide. Man is not the source of authority. Bible, the Bible is where we look for salvation, to know how we please God. And friend, when someone starts telling us things to do about salvation, that we don't find in the Bible, friend, we need to realize that's the devil and his craftiness trying to remove us from the simplicity of Christ. And so be on the watch for that. Be careful. When you hear something about God or the Bible or salvation, you know, one of the first things you ought to ask yourself is, is that what the Bible teaches? What they're saying, can it be found in the Word of God? And does that represent the simplicity that we find in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Then as we continue to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we need to be sure that we should never put up with another gospel or a different spirit of the gospel. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and notice what Paul here says in verse number 4. For he says, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not accepted, Paul said, and he's worried about this, he says, you may well put up with it. Here's the problem. There are people out there preaching a different gospel. There are people out there with the wrong spirit or motive. There are people who are trying to pawn some false gospel and false religion on people. And Paul says, what really scares me is you may put up with it and you may accept it. Friend, again, the encouragement for us is what's found in 1 John 4. John says in 1 John 4, verse 4, or verses 1 through 4, test the spirits to see whether they are God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, let's ask another question. If I'm to test the spirits, how do I do that? Well, I've got to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. If my faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, and I've got to prove all things, then friend, I need to take the Bible and I need to check when somebody brings a different gospel. I need to check the Word of God when somebody preaches things that maybe I've never heard of or aren't what I'm used to. Now, it may be right, and I want to go with it if it goes with God's Word. But friend, we want to make sure what we're being taught is true to the Word of God. Now, Please understand as I say this, there are a lot of very nice, very kind, very suave people out there, but a lot of them who are not teaching the true gospel are actually Satan's ministers of light in disguise. Let me show you. Look in your Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to see that Satan and his ministers sometimes transform themselves into what the Bible refers to as angels of light although they contain deep darkness. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and I want you to see what the Scripture says in verses 13 and 14. Paul says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, it's no wonder they do that. What do you mean? For Satan himself, transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, if it is no great thing, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. What's Paul getting at here? Paul's saying, not everybody who dresses like it, and looks like it, and maybe even uses words that sound like it, is telling you the true gospel. Not everybody who comes to you, Paul says, is an apostle. Now, we understand the apostles were in the first century, but not everybody who comes to you and says, I am a preacher of the gospel, I'm here to tell you what God says, is really God's servant. Because Satan himself had the representation of a minister of light, and he says it's no wonder then that his servants also look like ministers of light. What's that mean? Are they really ministers of light? No, but they present that false aura 
they put on a good facade. They look religious, they sound religious, maybe in people's minds they even wear religious garb, they use religious words, but friend, their teaching is so far removed from the Bible that it's not God's teaching, it's Satan's teaching. Let me illustrate a couple of ways. We live in a world where there's a very large religious group and we, that so many people have been deceived into thinking that some human being, some man, can actually grant forgiveness of sins. We're talking about Roman Catholicism and the papacy. Uh, to see people bow and kiss his ring or kiss his feet and to hear him stand there and they say, you know, Father, I've sinned, forgive me, and him be able to act like he can forgive. And No. You don't find any of that in the Bible. In fact, you know what you do find? Jesus said in Matthew 23, 9, Call no man father. Men don't have that power. He's not the vicar of Christ reigning in the place of Christ today. He's not the head of the church because the church is not decapitated. Jesus is still the head, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Now, I'll give you a second illustration. Along with Roman Catholicism and the papacy, which is completely foreign to the Bible and is a minister of Satan, Let's also realize that false gospels like teaching that all you've got to do to be saved is say the sinner's prayer is also not God's plan of salvation. They're also ministers of Satan. Now, friend, we don't say that to be unkind, but we say it to point people toward the Bible. Hear me well on this. Along with Billy Graham and others, there are a ton of evangelists who have gone around uh, the world and have taught that to be saved, you need to say the sinner's prayer. And here's going to go something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Savior. Savior, I ask you now to come into my heart and save me. My friend, here's what I challenge on that, challenge you on concerning that. You can read your Bible from the very first verse in Genesis to the very last verse in Revelation 22, and you'll never one time find the sinner's prayer as a means of salvation. Now hear me well on that. The sinner's prayer is found nowhere in the Bible. In the Bible, we don't find people being told. In the book of Acts, when people are learning about salvation, Peter or Paul never says, I want you to say this sinner's prayer and you'll be... No, that's not what we find in the Bible. That is a false gospel. Those people, although they may be suave and kind and present a good, they're not God's ministers because they're not teaching what the Bible says on salvation. Let me illustrate. First time the gospel was preached in Acts chapter 2, people got the point. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says they got it. They were cut to the heart and they realized they'd killed their own Messiah. They cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter did not stand up and say, say the sinner's prayer. Peter did not say, here's my ring, you want to kiss it and I'll forget? No, that's not what he said. You know what Peter said? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us those who gladly received his word were baptized, verses 41 through 43, and God, not man, added them to his church, those who are being saved. Acts 2, verse 47. And so I know some of those things may be different. And we're not trying to be unkind. But friend, when the Bible says there are ministers of Satan who look like ministers of light, let's realize their kinfolk are still around today. And they're still doing the same thing. And we need to be aware of that and we need to test that by the Word of God. Now, Paul, as much as anybody, stood for truth and he did what was right. But you know, there are times in Paul's life that as a servant of God, he had to suffer. And there are going to be times in my life and yours when suffering is a reality that we have to go through. Let's not let that shock us because even the Apostle Paul had to face that. I want you to notice this with me in 2 Corinthians 11, verse number 22 following. Paul says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. For the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. 
Three times I was ship shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in city, in perils in the wilderness, in peril in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside these other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Friend, God's not promised that we won't face challenges or that we won't face difficulty or that there won't be hardships. But here's what He has promised us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible says, No temptation has overtaken us except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who with the temptation will also make the way of escape that we may be able to bear it. I've not been promised I won't face temptations and burdens and perils and difficulties, but I have been promised, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, and I'll help you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul now discusses one of the major problems he has, and that was his thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, Paul will say uh, he was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to beat him, lest he should be glorified uh, above measure. And so as we think about Paul's challenges and difficulties, some of those were even very personal to him. I don't know, nor does anybody else know for sure, what that thorn in the flesh was, except that it was a constant irritant, constant problem, constant menace in his flesh that bothered the Apostle Paul. And Paul prayed to God that he would remove that thorn in the flesh. But do you remember what it was that God said in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 9? God said to Paul, Paul prayed three times, God, remove this thorn in the flesh from me. And here's what God said, My grace is sufficient for you. God didn't, didn't remove that the way Paul would necessarily have liked for him to. But God took care of Paul. And God will take care of me and you. Friend, every burden, every heartache, uh, every problem, every thorn in the flesh is not going to go away like that. But you know what we do have as a constant balm to our soul and a constant relief? God's grace is sufficient. What does that mean? I can't help but think of what Paul said in Romans 8, verse number 18. Paul said, For I consider the sufferings of this present world they're not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. God's grace, which provides us with salvation, which provides us with a church family, and which ultimately provides us with heaven. The things we face in this life, not even a drop in the bucket, compared to how wonderful and glorious heaven's going to be. One of the things that Paul will surely illustrate in this text in 2 Corinthians 12 is that even though we face challenges and hardship, everything we do ought to be done out of edification for each other. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 19. The Bible says this, Again, do you think that we excuse ourselves to you? We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, beloved, for your edification. In the Christian life, we want to think about how we can build ourselves up and how we can build each other up. And yes, the world's going to try to knock you down. Yes, Satan's going to try to knock your props out from under you. There are going to be difficulties and challenges as we've seen. But let's make sure as Christians, we be that encouraging force. Exhort or encourage one another daily. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Then as we think about this text and as we think about Paul's concluding words here, Paul mentions that as Christians, from time to time, we also need to do a little self-examination. It's possible, as we mentioned, for the devil to get into our lives. And it's possible for even him to do it in such a crafty way that we might even trick ourselves or be fooled into thinking that everything's okay when it's not. And thus, a little self-examination is always in place. Look at Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 13, verse number 5. Paul says this, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 
Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. And so from time to time we want to ask ourselves, are we really living like we ought to? Has the devil found a way into my life? We want to think about, are my priorities really what they need to be? Am I really putting the kingdom of God first? Matthew 6 verse 33 is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Philippians 1 verses 19 through 21. Am I really putting God first in worship? Am I making worship to God a priority in my life? Is my example the example that it ought to be? Let your light so shine before men, Jesus said, that you may, people may see your good works and glorify your Father who art in heaven. Uh, am I really being the type of example for my kids and my wife and for my co-workers and for people in worship? Is my speech what it ought to be? Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, so that you know how to answer every one, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 following would say. And so from time to time, we've got to stop and slow down and, and really look at our own lives and, and ask ourselves some hard questions and be ready for the answers and be ready to look into the Word of God, which is our mirror, James 1, through 25, and make changes where they're necessary. A person who's not willing to change, who isn't willing to examine himself, really isn't the type of person who's living in accord with the Bible. We've got to always be ready to amend our ways and make changes where necessary and put God in His plan first in our lives. As Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8, we can do nothing against the truth but for it. We want our lives as Christians to be lived for the truth. The truth is what saves, John 8 verse 32, and the truth is what we're going to be judged by, John chapter 12 verse number 48. And so let's live in such a way that we promote truth and that we're not doing anything against the truth of God's Word. Friend, as we've thought about the book of 2 Corinthians, the beautiful picture that Paul paints here is that he truly is a committed disciple and apostle of Christ. He never would have faced what he faced were he not in it for the right reasons. And those who were saying that Paul wasn't a true apostle, they're not actually holding to the simplicity of Christ. And thus we want to put our trust and hope in the inspired Word of God and in God's example and pattern that we find in the New Testament. And we hope and pray that as we've studied this wonderful book together, that we've been uplifted, we've been encouraged, and we've been motivated to focus on heaven, to put our emphasis on the things that really matter, and to not get bogged down in the affections of this world rather to give ourselves fully to God and to His cause. Friend, we want to ask you today, are you a member of the Lord's church? Have you really obeyed the gospel that we find in the New Testament? It's a very simple plan. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except by Him. John 14, verse 6. Nor is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. He's the only way to be saved. He's the only Savior. Have you believed that? In Acts chapter 8, as Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch are going down the road in the chariot, in the distance, the Ethiopian eunuch sees water, and he's been taught about that. And so he says, here's water. See, here's water. What hinders me? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse number 24. Do you believe it so much so that you would examine yourself, repent of things that are not right, and turn to God? Acts 3, verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn, or repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. In Luke 13, certain people came to Jesus and they wanted to ask Jesus, in essence, about the vengeance of God. What about these 18 people that are walking down the road and out of nowhere a tower falls on them? Wasn't that God's vengeance taking His uh, justice on those evil people? And Jesus said, No, but unless you repent, 
you'll all likewise perish. Jesus was very pointed in telling men that they needed to repent or perish. And so repentance is a biblical part of God's plan of salvation. And so once we believe, are we willing to repent and change our lives? Would you make the good confession that Jesus is the Savior of the world? In Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Like the Ethiopian eunuch, we need to confess, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Having made that good, good confession, have we been immersed in water for the forgiveness of our sins? You see, my friend, baptism is a burial. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And in that burial, we contact the death of Jesus and His blood saves us from our sins. But please don't misunderstand me. Baptism is essential to salvation. Ananias came to visit Saul of Tarsus, who'd been blinded by the Lord. He was told by the Lord to. And when he got there, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Listen now. Wash away your sins. The blood of Jesus saves. We contact that blood in the watery grave of baptism. Romans 6, 1 through 4, Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. And then we rise out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. If you are a child of God, then friend, we want to offer encouragement to you to never ever give up. Don't quit running the Christian race. Be faithful to the end and don't let anything, the devil, Satan, anything, distract you from that ultimate goal. We live in a world where there's a lot of hardship. We live in a world where there's a lot of problems. We live in a world where there's a lot of hatred and violence and and there's so many things that if the Christian let himself, could talk him into giving up. Friend, but there's one thing that's worth it all. Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present world, they're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Heaven will be worth it all. Don't give up. God loves you. We love you. Join us next time as we study together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.